Hello from Clio Cloud Conference 2017 in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm Christopher Anderson. And I'm Mark Britton, I guess. <laughs> as, you as are. As Chris points to me, I think that's my cue. And we're on the road with Legal Talk Network. <laughs> We're back. Thank you so much for joining us on the road. It's a pleasure to be here in the Big Easy, and today we are talking about the demand-driven enterprise. Uh, practice, enterprise, organization, whatever it might be. And uh, we're talking with Mark Britton. Uh, Mark, can you just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm the founder of Avo. Uh, Avo's been around now for... 11 years, unbelievably. Yeah, yeah. Although 10 years since launch, and um, it's it's our baby. We we love it, and we often joke that we're the match.com of legal and that we put together needy consumers with uh, awesome lawyers and let them go off and live their legal life together. So that's what we do at Avo. Fantastic. And so you chose to make a presentation today, or you were asked to make a presentation today about demand-driven organizations. First of all, what does it mean to be a demand-driven organization? I think demand-driven is one of those big business words that freaks lawyers out, but it just means understanding who your customer is, learning about them, and then building products and services that are responsive to their desires. Well, when you say it that way, it just sounds dumb, you know, like, of course everybody does that, but the truth is everybody doesn't do that. So, like, to contrast it, like, wh how do many lawyers, many law firm businesses fail to act like demand-driven organizations? Well, yeah start from the other end of the equation. If you think about lawyers being the suppliers of legal services and then sometimes firms or the bars as an intermediary in interfacing with consumers, um, so often the supplier and the distributor, again, lawyers, bar, law firm, uh, they are pretty sure that they know what the consumer wants without ever speaking to the consumer. I mean, one of my pet peeves that anyone who's seen some of my speeches or, or some of my writing probably is, is tired of hearing about, but it just, it blows me away when we talk to Supreme Courts, bars, groups of lawyers, that when they talk about what, how the legal profession should evolve, and I ask them, so what is, what is the customer? What do your customers say about that? And they don't know. They've never done any of that work. And I don't, I don't know how we push the legal profession forward if we don't spend a lot of time talking to our customers and potential customers. Right, so and it, I, that makes total sense. And then by who should be talking to them, I guess what you're saying is the bar should be talking to the end users, the, the, the law firm clients. The courts should be talking to the law firm clients and the lawyers should be talking to the law firm clients. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, so if you look in any other industry, as they think from a macroeconomic level of where the industry's going and how they can develop it better. So let's start with medicine, for example. The number of think tanks that they have around the medical, the, the delivery of medical services, the amount of research and development that um, both the bigger hospitals, that the drug companies, everyone that's involved in that supply chain, that they do to understand the customer's wants, needs, hopes, dreams, desires, et cetera, it's just what they do in order to push the industry forward. And we don't, we don't do it in legal. There's this tremendous hubris that we have in legal that is uh, our customers, it's almost like we act like they, because they don't have our law degree, that, they're, that we don't want to know what they think because we know what's best. And that, that's getting us into trouble. I, so again, one of my primary hypotheses is that that is what's driving the do-it-yourself market because they don't know or don't want to interact with lawyers because we're not uh, we're not helping them and and by the way i would put the judicial system into that as well yeah uh, that, that would make total sense and it does seem like there is this huge mass of consumers who feel that legal services are unapproachable, unavailable to them. Um, with, and they're very unsophisticated buyers of legal services because they don't know how to pick a lawyer. I mean, they, right. they, they, they open the well, yellow They don't pages. even know what lawyers do. Right, yeah. they, they, but they, they know that sometimes you need them. Right, exactly. But now there's some people telling them, well, maybe you don't. You know, Maybe you can go online and get this form and do it yourself. 
without any warnings around that. And then you've got lawyers saying the market's really tough. Uh, you know, the, 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 the number of clients is bad and they're going to this other stuff. We can't, they're not listening to us. What can these lawyers do? Like, what are a couple of steps that they can take to start to, I mean, you say they should talk to the, to the, to the potential customers, but in a, in a world where lawyers don't actually like talking to them, what can they do to start to get to know? Like, what, are there some methodologies, some practices that they can in, implement? Yeah, so in my speech, I give the example as just a broader setup of Uber. And, you know, Uber went out to the customers first and said, um, how would you, how could we improve your life in day-to-day -day transportation? And they said, well, I'd like to be able to use my phone and I'd like to have a, a, a pricing schema that I understand and I would like to push a button and have a car show up very quickly or at least you be able to show me when that car is going to show up and I want to know it's going to be a clean car with, a, with a, an accomplished driver and just taking all of the question marks out of the service delivery equation, which is with the cab world has been pretty cruddy for a long time. And it exploded because they listened to the customer. And, and so very similarly, you know, Avo has done the same thing around uh, the, the different services that we offer, but specific to a lawyer within their own firm, it's, it's really kind of a three-step process, and, and I tried to lay these out very simply in my speech, but you know, it, we are talking to customers and prospective customers and past customers all the time, right? Like, it's just all, all these different ways that we're constantly having these discussions. And have you set any objectives around what you want to learn from those discussions? Right. I mean, it could be as simple, and I've been saying this for 10 years, but it could be as simple as in a prospective customer, how did you find me? And yet still lawyers just refuse to ask that simple question. They think it's unseemly. Yeah. I, I think of that question as almost trite because I've used it as an example probably 800 times, and yet still it's like the simplest way to generate some data around what's working for you, and lawyers are afraid to do it. Okay, so anyway, communication. And then uh, I talk about how a lot of these companies, whether it's Uber or Avo or anybody else, um, demand-driven economies who or demand-driven companies who are very good at being responsive to the customer. What do they do? Well, they create hypotheses around what would be good for the customer, and then they go out and actually test in small iterative tests. Uh, whether the customer responds to whatever they think would be good for them. And if the, so, you know, so one of the, the example I gave from the stage, let's say that you feel, you believe that your billing cycle is longer than it should be and that you, you're having a lot of clients not paying and that's higher than it should be. Well, maybe you develop a hypothesis that says if we took credit cards, that we could speed up the time of payment and reduce the number of deadbeat clients. Right? That's a hypothesis. Okay. Carve off a small segment of your customers and go test it. Yeah. Ask them. Or, or, yeah. Like, just, or, or just do it. Just see do what it. happens. Right. right. Or would you rather, you know, or give them the option. Would you rather pay by check or by credit card? And by the way, with the credit card, we will give you a 5% discount. You know, these little things where lawyers are like, you know, they smack themselves in the head like, I never would have thought of that. Well, and you, but you started this by saying that lawyers, part of the problem is that the, the, the hubris or the presumption that they know what the clients want. And but what I'm hearing is that's actually not a bad thing to think you know what the clients want. It's a, it is a step. That's just the, the hypothesis, the, right? So. But then you yeah, instead of knowing it, you say I think, and then you test it, and then you then you can know. Yeah. So what I say in Avo all the time to the team is, let's get out of the land of thinks. I don't care what you think or I think. I care what we know, and we don't know unless we test it. And the other thing that I guarantee people are going to hear in firms that they've experienced is two big ego lawyers who are arguing with one another about what they think. And the way that you solve that is you say, great, let's test it. Let's test it. And I, like how often in firms are people saying, oh, we have a disagreement. You know what? Let's test it. And, and that's how we solve so many of our issues within AVO because we have smart people and maybe both answers are right or maybe both are wrong, but let's test it. So anyway, I said the three pieces, communication, testing things, and measuring, you know, the, the other, as part of testing, you have to have that hypothesis, have that objective, and then measure. 
to. Right, good. When you do the test, you have to say, I think it's going to land here. Here, right. And so then when you test, if it doesn't land there, you could say, all right, that was either better or worse. Um, and maybe let's test something a little bit different. Let's, let's adjust the parameters. Yeah, let's, it, yeah, right. let's change something. And then what that does is spits out uh, data. And data, you know, testing and measuring is just seeing what works. That's all it is. Data is just counting, right? And we hear words like data and lawyers just go, oh my God, I, I just, I can't do that. But, you know, the, the best law firms, the best lawyers, they're becoming data companies. They're understanding how to harness all the data that flows through their firm to better, better target customers or run their operations more efficiently, et cetera. But uh, taking in information through this testing and just putting it into very simple, like an Excel spreadsheet or having someone put it into an Excel spreadsheet so that you can count and understand whether your tests are working and also cutting that data in a couple of different ways to come up with new tests and new opportunities. Yeah. I bet what people will find when they do this is that, in fact, they're doing a lot of things and paying a lot of money, putting a lot of investment in things customers don't care about at all. And then not making those investments in things that the customers do care about. And, and what's uh, you're totally right, Chris, but this happens in big businesses all the time. And so, but you don't find it if all you sit around and do is think, right? Like, it, it, or, or drive decisions based on the things. But I'll tell you just from my own personal experience, um, the number of times being the CEO that I have sat and looked at a product and said, I don't think this looks very good. I don't like this. I don't, I'm just offering my regal opinion. And having, fortunately, we have a culture that I think we've cultivated well at Avo, where the product team, for example, will say, well, let's test it. Because we, you know, it's great that you think that, but clearly we disagree because we built it this way and let's test it. And I have been caught off guard so many times where I was just sure how a test would come back and, it, and what I thought was wrong. And so we all have our blind spots, and we need to get better as, uh, as individual lawyers, as firms, as bars, as an industry, of getting out of that mode of we know best. And, and, uh, and I guarantee you the industry will, will be as surprised as I am in running the, the big company that, that I run. Yeah, and it, when you know, well, the knowledge is in the customer. Because at, at, at the end of the day, you weren't right or wrong. The customers just wanted it this way. Exactly. And they're the ones who will make or break the law firm, the your business, and at the end of the day, the judiciary in either removing their trust or giving their trust to that to that enterprise. Yeah, and, and that is, the, the tough part about it is that it is the more that you ignore it, the more, um, uh, it, it's actually quite latent, right? So if you're not searching for these things, um, it can kind of, you can say, hey, my practice is really good right now. But if you're not testing new ideas, your practice can erode and you don't really know why. And so constantly, you know, as a team or as an industry, but I think as an individual law firm, sitting down and saying, what do we think are the biggest levers in driving our business? How can we improve that? And let's test a couple of things. And you know what? 90% of tests fail. Great. You've learned a ton in all of that failure. But to your, you, you said it very well. Like, if you're not tapping into the wisdom of your customers and how they're evolving, that latency, like, you fall behind and you don't even notice that you're falling behind. Sure. And, and as with the great example you gave earlier of Uber, which I, to me does stand sort of above and beyond is to find they found an industry that was just really hurting for innovation um, and listened to the customers and found what the key elements were. Just like that in law, I mean, it happened fast. I mean, you know, nothing happens overnight, but a taxi cab industry that's been basically the same for a hundred years yeah. in five years has been Tipped. upended. Yes. Yeah. And we, we are, I think the legal industry stands ready for, for the same sort of, I hate to use the hackneyed word disruption, but the same sort of innovative uh, change of our business that we could do ourselves if we just would listen to the customers. Yeah, I mean, this, this treads into some sensitive ground, but I mean, the, the reality is that the legal profession is a monopoly. 
And we take great comfort in the monopoly. And actually, monopolies are good if they are perfectly attuned. So if they're attuned to the customers, monopolies aren't inherently a bad thing. Uh, but as you see with the taxicab monopolies, which tend to go from city to city, ultimately the customers overthrew it because the monopoly abused the customer's trust. And no matter how much I talk with the, I, I spend a lot of time in closed door sessions with Supreme Courts and bars, et cetera, and helping them understand this, the legal profession is at a massive risk of having the monopoly overthrown. And with just a bit of sensitivity to the customer informing that monopoly, you could preserve it for decades to come. All right, so as we wrap up, what I'd like to do is, you, I think you suggested one question that lawyers should start asking is, how did you find me? Um, can you think of like maybe two other, let's, let's come, try to come out with three things that they should be asking their customers right now. Well, I mean, one of the problem is that the questions go to infinity, but let me throw out a couple, is that, uh, did I do a good job? Will you rate me? That's close to my heart. Okay, so, and yet all lawyers say, no, we do, well, I think we do a great job with our customers. Really? How are you measuring that? Okay, I think that the uh, customers that I reach through all of my marketing channels um, are the best customers that I can get. Really? Well, what is, do you even understand what the best customer is? Have you set any objectives around who are the customers that that take up the least amount of your time and drive the highest margin or the greatest satisfaction? You know, they're, they're just at a deeper level. It is so simple that you uh, set objectives for the levers that are driving the firm and test the levers. And then as part of that, when you speak to the customers, I mean, just like for you, Chris, I would say, what do you see as the biggest questions that law firms have? They say, is my marketing working? Um, do I, um, is there a way that I could work less and be paid more? Uh, maybe the third question is, if I wanted to expand my law firm, how would I go about that? So that's kind of like three we hear all the time, right? So how do, how do I grow through marketing? Um, uh, how can I be more efficient? How can I drive a higher ROI? And then how do I ultimately grow my practice beyond just bringing those customers in? Every one of those. So asking people about their um, uh, actually uh, doing just a little bit of testing and measuring and counting around your individual marketing channels, not hard. And that's, that's asking the customers, like, where did you find us now? How many of these turned into actual clients? And what was the lifetime value of those clients? Uh, the second being, like, how, how, do I, um, uh, how do I spend less time? Well, ha uh, have you, through your operational process, this may not be asking the customer directly, but through the data, saying, where are we spending the most amount of time? And how much are we getting paid? That's asking questions of your own processes. It's asking, kind of asking yeah. of the clients, but you already have the data, so right, you don't exactly. need to go out and ask them. And then the final, like, how do I do? I add new people? Do I? Well, okay. Once you know where the um, uh, your highest margins may be within your practice, well, now you know where you what uh, type of lawyer you might hire, or where you might bring in some non-lawyer help, like paralegals or clerks to lean into that part of the practice. So you're not just bringing in like, oh, you know, I, I, I'd like to hire another lawyer, so I'm going to go out and find a generalist who can help or just some paralegal and I'll plug them in. No, where are we making the most amount of money and now I know where I can hire and grow. Yeah. It's, it's these types of, so some of it's marketing, some of it's product, some of it's operational, but it's, it's um, understanding your firm and your customer at a slightly different level so that you can be data-driven, test and measure-driven, and ultimately demand-driven. Yeah, basically, you know the questions you want to ask. Just stop going with your gut reaction and measure, use, use, use objective data. And your customers will feel it. They'll feel it that you're, that you're mining this stuff. And so the example is maybe a closing example that I gave is, you know, that 
the customer walks in the door and you can already walk them through because you have modeled this kind of typical customer that you've got, that you're bringing in you say typically you have these types of issues here is generally the process here are the things you haven't thought about here are some things you're going to go through and you walk them through the entire process and you sign them up right there and they don't really need to interact with you more after that as you're walking them through the expungement process or what have you because you've already laid out for them the elements and how it'll happen and it feels very friction free it feels very simple for them because you've identified who they are you've told them the process and you you got them at quote unquote hello <laughs> exactly. and and that that's the goal keeping it simple but you only keep it simple by a lot of hard work and understanding them on the front end yeah and that's yeah like you said the, the, the hard work is behind the scenes the simplicity becomes in the relationship that you now thoroughly understand. All right, before we close it out for today, I have one last question for you, which is if our listeners would like to follow up, how could they reach you? So the easiest way is to send me a note through my AVO profile. So if they go to AVVO, AlphaVictorVictorOscar.com, and I have a, an AVO rated profile, just like every other lawyer in the country, and you can send me a note through that profile. You can also follow me at Mark underscore Britain on Twitter. And I have a lot of lawyers follow me on Facebook. So come find me through social media or AVO. And uh, I, I love to talk to lawyers because they're my customers. And that's how I and we as an organization learn. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And uh, we have reached the end of the road for today's episode. I want to thank our guests for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Mark Britton from thank AVA. Thank you. It's always fun. And we also want to thank our listeners for tuning in. If you, are, if you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. We'll see you next time for another episode of On the Road with Legal Talk Network. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. Or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Bye.